Well, hello. Welcome to our Wednesday Bible study podcast in the book of James. Uh, it's a dre dreary day today. It's uh, kind of rainy and cold. It's a typical fall day here in Michigan. And uh, so we're uh, kind of bundled up and heat's on again. And, you know, it's uh, time watching the leaves fall and uh, and starting to be the most, what I think is uh, the most beautiful time, although many people would disagree with me on the cold temperatures. Uh, I would say it's, it's, uh, I like cold. So, I mean, that's, that's kind of my thing. I like cold and, and so I enjoy fall. Uh, Athena loves the beauty of fall and that's what she's always ranting. It's her favorite holiday, her favorite season because of that. And so, uh, kind of excited. This is our, um, I'm going to do two podcasts today, two live casts. Um, the second one will not be released until next Wednesday, uh, because I'm taking a week off. Uh, my son is coming into town on Saturday, uh, the Saturday of our food ministry. I got to pick him up at the airport, and then we're going to try to spend as much time with our son as we can while he's here from San Antonio, and uh, before he has to go back to the, the the sweltering heat. And he told me the other day, and I quote, uh, "I have to wear a sweatshirt because it's 80 degrees here, Dad." Uh, I told him he might want to bring his winter gear because <laughs> if he's already adjusted that much to the to the heat and cold is 80 degrees, he is going to have some fun here. And uh, so uh, we're looking forward to that. So we're going to spend all the time we can. So I'm going to pre-record it and then drop it. So it won't show up in your feed like um, if you get a notification that we're going live, you won't get that notification next week because it'll just be dropped. So just keep an eye on our YouTube site and you'll see the uh, one click on and, uh, and then you can click on it and watch. Um, I'll look a lot like I look right now because uh, I should have just brought an extra shirt and chain so that everyone thought it was, you know, recorded separately, but I'll be recording them back to back. But so if you're free this weekend, we could use your help with the food ministry. Um, I won't be there. Athena won't be there. Um, and uh, so we, we can always use the extra help. Uh, if you can come out and you have time, there's always work to be done uh, and giving out food to those in need. And we have a lot of food to give away and it'll be it'll be a good day. Hopefully it'll run smoothly. I'm going to try to prep as much po as possible um, for me being gone to make sure that it's as easy as possible on everyone who's coming. So hopefully it'll be a simple day. And uh, and so, that, yeah, it'll be uh, it'll be hopefully a good day for everybody who comes out. So hopefully you'll come out. And then Sunday we're going to continue our. Uh, Fruit of the Spirit series, and we are uh, group going through them, love, joy, and this week is peace. And uh, so uh, come prepared to learn what God's version of peace is in our lives and how we can have more of it. But that gets us to James, uh, James chapter one. Hold on one second. I got to grab something. Yes, I sat down to do a Bible study and forgot my Bible. Uh, but James chapter 1, verses 19 through 27. If you have your Bibles, that's where we're going to be at. Hopefully you bring your Bibles uh, to a Bible study and then also bring them to church. It's always nice to have your Bible. I know we put the uh, words up on the screen, but it's nice to bring your Bible and follow along uh, and to use the Bible that you have. And so uh, it's always good. So if you're following along, it's right after Hebrews, a big book in the New Testament. And then we have James. And so we're going to be looking at 19 through 27. Uh, understanding this, my dear brothers and sisters, you must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get anger, angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. So get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts, for it has the power to save your souls. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it is like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. If you claim to be religious but don't control your tongue, you are fooling yourself. And your religion is worthless. Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God, the Father, means caring for the orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. 
So that is James chapter 1, 19 through 27, the, the rest of the chapter, first chapter of James. James, of course, uh, treats many important subjects in his epistle, but none more important than James 1, 19 through 27. One writer has said, nowhere is James richer than this wonderful paragraph. Lewis Evans noted, the sound of trumpets is in James 1, 22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving your own selves. In this passage, James gets down to the bedrock of the religion of our Lord as he discusses the need for being receptive to his word. In the physical world, most of us recognize the importance of good reception. I don't watch much TV live for sure, uh, but when we were kids, you would you remember the antennas. Sometimes you had an antenna on your house that you'd have to um, that you could spin electronically if you were wealthy. And then sometimes you had to get up there on the roof and spin the actual antenna. And if you had rabbit ears, you had to constantly be moving the rabbit ears. Do you remember those days? Oh, how the kids will never experience what it's like to wrap a rabbit ear in tinfoil and then hold it in one direction so your dad can watch the news. Um, so we that's what it's talking about in the importance of good reception or paying attention. Um, the importance of good reception is illustrated by a little story I heard one time. An American came in contact with an isolated group of Eskimos. To his surprise, they spoke English. English punctuated with squeals, howls, groans, and squawks. For instance, they would say, how, squawk, squeal, do you squeal, do? My name, groan, squawk, squeal, is Joe Howell. What screech squeal is yours? Rather amazed, the American asked, where did you learn to speak English? The answer came back, squawk, squeal, groan, shortwave, radio. But reception of a radio or TV program amounts to nothing as compared with the reception of God's word. In James 1.18, James says of his own will, God brought us forth by the word of truth. The question of this passage is this, what is your attitude towards the word? We have studied concerning tests of our faith, but there is no greater test of our faith than whether we whether we or not obey God's revealed will. James is writing to Christians, not unbelievers. It is vitally important that unbelievers have a right attitude toward the word to be receptive and obedient to the truth, but we must retain that attitude after we become Christians. I am sometimes asked, how can a non-Christian read Acts 2.38 and still believe that baptism is not important? I answer, this can be done in the same way Christians read Hebrews 10.25 and believe attendance is unimportant or read Matthew 19 and believe that they can get a divorce for any reason. The question of the hour is this, how is your reception? James begins by saying that if we are to have receptive hearts, three things must characterize us. He says, you know that my beloved brethren, but let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. James says to be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Unfortunately, most of us are the opposite. We're slow to hear, swift to speak, and swift to wrath. Each of James' instructions is good general advice, but in context, each ties in with our reception of God's word. The first one is swift to hear or quick to listen. At least two things are involved here, an eagerness to learn and a willingness to accept. The person with this quality takes advantage of every opportunity to learn, classes, preaching services, good literature, etc., and listens with rapt attention, ready to obey. There is an art to good listening. It has been well said that great listeners make great preaching. The second one is slow to speak. Now, let me just go back just for a second for the listening. Listening also helps you relate with people and helps you to um, understand people. So listen more than you talk. The second one is slow to speak. This does not refer to slowness when speaking, but being slow to start speaking. The following is good general advice. In the multitude of words, there wanteth not or lacketh not transgressions, but he that refraineth his lips does wisely. Let Proverbs 10, 19, let, the, let thy words be few, Ecclesiastes 5, 2, written by Solomon, the wisest man in the Bible, Old Testament. This refers in a special way to the reception of God's word. It is almost impossible to learn as you are talking. 
Wilson Miner said, a good listener is not only popular everywhere, but after a while, he knows something. It has been suggested that God gave us two ears and only one mouth because he wanted us to listen at least twice as much as we speak. I have heard that mentioned many times when I'm mouthing off. The final one is slow to wrath. Again, this is good general advice. Verse 20 stresses that the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Uh, the NIV, NIV says man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. As a matter of fact, anger or wrath generally produces the exact opposite of righteousness. During the emotional turmoil and heated passion of anger, we lose our power to reason and often say hurtful words and do stupid things. I think anyone who's married knows exactly what we're talking about. Looking at them in a general way, these verses tell me two things. First, a person with a quick temper has nothing to be proud of. And second, temper can be can be controlled. Verse 20 is an import, imperative mood, and God never asks the impossible. But I buffet my body, Paul said, Paul. I bring it into bondage, and again, he says, I can do all things through him that strengthens me. Philippians 4.13. In context, the words slow to wrath are primarily concerned about the reception of God's word. Did you know that some people become angry when God's word hits them? Jeremiah 36 tells of a king who became so upset at the reading of God's word that he cut out the parts he didn't like and burned them in the fire. I have known people who left congregations because they didn't like the preaching or unworldliness, divorce, and the like. When God's word hits you, the consciousness, the conscious begins to smart. There are at least two ways you can soothe the conscience. You can repent, change your life, receive forgiveness, and thus have peace of mind. Or you can become angry and attack the one who brought the unpleasant truth, thus turning attention from yourself to another, thus easing your conscience. A lot of people fight that way. A lot of people try to focus on your mistakes instead of learning from their own mistakes. Many people are like this. I, I see this all the time. And, and I, you know, everyone struggles with it in some form or fashion. When somebody points out your faults, you want to say, well, well, you're not such a great person, right? And that you get into those uh, arguments where you're deflecting what is truth by uh, putting the attention on somebody else. And when you do that, nobody learns. Uh, and the truth is not relevant in your life and changes who you're supposed to be. Uh, so when God's word hits you, but let it be clearly understood that the latter course is spiritual suicide. It does no good to get angry at a barometer when it indicates that a storm is approaching. It does no good to smash the scales when they indicate you are overweight. And it does no good to get angry at the proclaimer of God's word. When someone preaches the truth in love, Ephesians 4.15, that person is your friend. Even when the truth hits you hard, Paul says, so that I may become your enemy by telling you the tr truth. Uh, Galatians 4.16, or as Joe Malone puts it, I'm not your enemy, I'm telling you the truth. But how can we have the kind of mind that is receptive, swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to become angry? The answer is preparation. In verse 21, James uses the illustration of preparing the garden to receive the seed. Wherefore, putting away all filthiness and overflowing of wickedness, receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. The word translated putting away is commonly used in the New Testament to refer to taking off clothes, Acts 7.58. But since the total picture is that of preparing the seedbed, Moffat translates the first part of the verse, so clear away all the foul rank growth or the weeds. Uh, in a physical gardening, we recognize the need to get rid of the bad to give the good the best possible chance. And this is also true in the spiritual realm. We need to eradicate every spiritual trait contrary to God's will. But James mentions two especially noxious weeds that have to go if we are able to receive God's word. Filthiness and overflowing of wickedness. Filthiness is commonly used in scripture to refer to that which is filthy or repulsive, such as uh, clothing, Zechariah 3, 3 and 4, used it in a general way. It refers to moral uncleanness. Overflowing of wickedness can easily be illustrated. To get the feeling of this phrase, imagine a bubbling cesspool overflowing in your backyard 
or to stay with the main illustration used in this verse, imagine obnoxious and persistent weeds spreading quickly over all the land that you are trying to cultivate. Uh, Steve made a, a reference to, um, he thinks we put straw in the garden here at the church, and he thinks uh, may have produced a weed. And when he did research on the weed, because he couldn't, he couldn't seem to get rid of it. When they did research on the weed, they actually said, move the garden. So the weed was so bad that they encouraged you just to get a new garden because that weed is so bad. That's what he's referring to with the overflowing of wickedness. You go to look at your garden and the weeds have overflown it. And then you take them all out. It's just, it won't go away. Filthiness refers to outward uncleanliness while sin overflows from within, Matthew 12, 34. So one paraphrase read, reads the first part of verse 21. So get rid of all that is wrong in your life, both inside and outside. The point is that we need to recognize the loathsomeness of sin. As long as sin is attractive to us, as long as we want to hold on to it, we will never be in a position to accept truth. But when sin is repulsive to us, then we can follow James' instructions. Receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. In contrast with the wrath of verses 19 and 20, uh, in contrast with the hardness of heart caused by the wickedness of verse 21, we are told to receive the word with meekness. Meekness is not weakness. It is rather inward strength, voluntarily submitting to the will of God. It has been called quiet strength or harnessed power. It is exemplified by the attitude of the Bereans. They receive the word with all readiness of mind, Acts 1711. In that kind of receptive soil, the seed of God's word, Luke 8, 11, can do great things. Much of this is implied in the word engrafted. The Greek word translated engrafted is a hard word to translate into English. In an effort to convey the full concept of the word, some translations have planted or implanted or even rooted. The picture is not of the new plant that can be easily pulled up and destroyed. The picture is of the plant growing down, becoming firmly rooted and fixed in the soil, and all thus becoming strong and healthy. When God's word becomes thus rooted and fixed in our lives and minds, we can have great hope for the future. Thus a paraphrase reads, the wonderful message we have received is able to save our souls as it takes hold of our hearts. Properly receiving God's word is a powerful thing. The last verse of 20, part of 21, is a great tribute to that power, the implanted word which is able to save your souls. The phrase which is able is a participle form of the Greek word translated power. In Romans 1.16, the Greek word from which we get dynamic, dynamo, and dynamite. In Romans 1.16, God's word has power to save the unbeliever. In James 1.21, God's word has power to continue to save the child of God. Surely there is nothing more important than the salvation of our souls. Never call the Bible a dead book, nor refer to the mere word, God's word has power. We must be ready to obey the word, but when does the powerful world's word save us? It would seem obvious that true reception of the word includes obeying that word. I could hardly be said to be receptive to my doctor's instructions if I failed to obey them, uh, which is what I seem to do. Uh, as we have seen, the phrase implanted word indicates that the word is growing and having its effect in our lives, but it is not necessary to arrive at this conclusion by indirect reasoning. James says plainly, be doers of the word and not hearers only deluding your own selves, James 1.22. The hearers in this verse are far different from those who are swift to hear. These hearers are sermon tasters with a lecture attended attend their mentality whose lives are not affected by what they hear. It has always been far easier to fill our building with hearers than with doers. We have far too many homiletic hearers, sermon samplers, lecture learners, evangelistic evaluators, uh, and preacher puller aparters who do not apply the message to themselves who go away unaffected. There's no greater joy in my life when somebody says to me, it's like you wrote that message for me. I know it's God writing the message and knowing the need of the hearts of the people that are in the audience. And so he makes it happen. But it means someone's listening. And they're willing to apply and reason and listen to what God is saying in their life through the truth of the word. 
We have nothing but contempt for the deceiver who takes advantage of others and nothing but pity for the deceived. But what about those who are self-deceived? They are at the same time the most despicable and the most to be pitied. For it is a thousand times harder to under, underceive, undeceive the one who has been deceived by self than it is the one who has been deceived by another. The self-deceived one wants to be deceived. He believes what he wants to believe. The truth may be preached and, and most elegantly, but the self-deceived one manages to ignore it, discount it, or apply it to others. Such a man, James continues, is extremely foolish. Jesus compared the type of individual with a foolish man building his house on sifting sand, Matthew 7, 26 and 27. James uses this illustration, For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding a natural face in the mirror, looking in the mirror. For he beholdeth himself, go away straightway, forgetting what, what he looks like. The illustration of that, looking at oneself in a mirror, in those days, mirrors weren't made of glass, uh, but rather some kind of polished metal but they were still sufficient to see oneself. The phrase natural face refers to the, one, to the one you are born with, the one other people have to look at. When I see the phrase, I think of this bit of doggerel from, from the youth. I know my face ain't no star. I know how ugly, how ugly it are, but I don't mind it because I'm behind it. It's the folks in front that get the jar. Sometimes I do look at the natural face, when I look in the mirror, especially in the morning, there is this face, puffy with sleep, covered with scruffy stubble. There are bloodshot eyes filled with sleep, and there is tussled, uh, well, eyebrows and goatee tussled all over the place because, well, I don't have hair anymore. I used to have that problem with bedhead. Do you remember that? <laughs> I don't have that problem anymore. It's amazing. I can give you the solution for that. There you go. All right. That natural face doesn't do much for me. But as adult as I am, when I first wake up, I still have enough common sense to know that the depressing look in the mirror will do me no good unless I do something about what I see. So I can repair the damage, which many people do. They spend hours um, putting makeup on. They comb their hair. They curl their hair. They do all kinds of different things, shave, do everything they can to make themselves look better. Let me underline where this man's foolishness lay. We might think that this man didn't really get a good look at himself, but the words beholding in verse 23 and 24 do not refer to a quick glance, but to a lengthy contemplation. The man did get a good look at himself. So in what way was he foolish? He then did nothing about it. I don't know why he did nothing about what he saw. Maybe he didn't res recognize the reflected images himself. I am told that some of the primitive tribes in New Guinea have no mirrors. When visitors take pictures, the natives are able to recognize others in the pictures, but not themselves. Maybe he did nothing about what he saw because he had some confused idea that the situation would correct itself. Some way, in other words, he felt no personal obligation. Probably the best suggestion as to why he did nothing about it ties in with the phrase, he went away. He turned to other things and immediately became so involved that he forgot what manner of man he was. It is not uncommon for people to hear God's truth and be moved for the moment. But when they leave and are quickly caught up in the world again, the moment is gone, sometimes forever. Whatever the reason, James indicates that it is foolish, ridiculous, pathetic to know what needs to be done and not to do it. In contrast to that, James then speaks of the man who looks into the mirror and does something about what he sees. But he that looketh into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and so continues, be, being not a hearer that forgetteth, but a doer that works, this man shall be blessed in all that he's doing. This verse contains another tribute to God's word. The perfect law, the law of liberty spoken of here is the same as the word of truth in verse 18 and the implanted word in verse 21. Verse 25 tells us three things about God's word. First, it is a law because it contains commands from our King Jesus. The New Testament is not a legal system as was the Old Testament but it still contains law, basic principles which must guide our lives. Thus we read of the law of Christ, a law of faith, Romans, the law of spirit, Romans 8, 2. Second, it is not only a law, it is a perfect law. Perfect is from telos, last, or end, or complete. The New Testament is God's final revelation to earth dwellers. 
satisfying every spiritual need, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Finally, it is the perfect law, the law of liberty. The words law and liberty may appear to be contradictory, but real liberty and freedom come only when there are laws that protect our freedom. The only real free people spiritually are those who have voluntarily submitted themselves to the service of God because of their love and appreciation. But now this perfect law of liberty is compared to a mirror. A mirror can have many purposes. A mirror can be used as in a periscope to look at others and that it is the only way some use the Bible. Or a mirror can be used to reflect sunlight, to flash signal or blind someone. And, and some always turn the spotlight of the word in another direction. But basically, a mirror is designed to look at oneself. And that is the primary way James says we ought to use God's word. If I will take time to look at myself in the mirror of God's word, comparing my life with its teachings, I will see myself not necessarily as I would like to be, but as I really am. But that look will not help me if I do nothing about it. Nor will it bless me if I stop looking and forget what manner of man I am. James says, but he that looketh into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and so continues, being not a hearer that forgets, but a doer that works, this man shall be blessed in all that he's doing. We must continue in two things. We must continue to look. Educational psycholog psychology tells us that we forget more in the first eight hours after hearing a thing than in the next three weeks. We must be constantly refreshing our memory of God's truth, and we must continue to do. There is no other way to have God's blessings. In verse 26 and 27, what is the sort of thing involved in doing the word? In the next two verses, James gives three illustrations of being an attentive doer instead of a forgetful hearer. Three examples of practical Christianity, how we speak, how we serve, and how we separate ourselves from the world. Notice his illustration concerning speaking. If any man thinks he's religious, while he doesn't bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this man's religion is useless or vain. We have already noted that James told us to be slow to speak. Chapter 3 tells us with the tongue, James knew what a preacher acquaintance of mine found out from taking an extensive poll. Although people in the world may not use the language they should, they still have no respect for someone who claims to be a Christian and yet does not bridle his tongue. The words religious and religion in verse 26 come from the Greek word that refers to the outward manifestation of religion, external rites or services. So the man pictured goes to the services, he sings, he prays and gives, he partakes of the Lord's Supper, but when he leaves, he has an unbridled or runaway tongue. He uses vile language, his bad mouth ushers, his bad mouth others, he praises himself, he fills the air with useless words. Two things are true of him, says James. He is self-deceived, like the fellow we noted in verse 22, for he too is a hearer and not a doer, and his religion is vain, empty, or useless. No man can get to heaven on a vain religion, as someone had said. He gets caught in his own mouth trap. Notice his illustration about sharing. Pure religion and undefiled before our God and Father is this, to visit, visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. In contrast with vain, empty religion, James tells us pure and undefiled religion that meets God's approval. There is no attempt to cover every aspect of pure religion, but James does give illustrations of both the positive and negative sides of the religion of Christ. On the positive side, James says they are they uh, we, that we are here to help people share what we have. Pure religion is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. The word translated fatherless is the word orphan. The root meaning of the word translated widow is I need. The English words indicate that those who have lost the father or husband by death, but the Greek words will allow wider usage. Death is not the only word starting with D that can remove the breadwinner. There is also desertion, drink, disease, dope, divorce, and delinquency. The point being made is that people are in real need representative of all who have physical, spiritual, or emotional needs. Brother Marshall Keeble used to say that the passage says we are here to visit the widows in their affliction, not in their affection. And what is the response of pure religion to the needs? Uh, the ASV and Key James Version have visit. Note that the word is not limited to a social call. Think of all the passages that God to God visiting his people to punish or to bless. The word visit infers going to see to take care of the needs. This Moffat translates visit as to care for, while Godspeed has look after, 
Goodspeed as look after, and the NEB has go to the help of, in some cases, as a friendly call may be what is needed. But many times there are other needs, some of which are very pressing. Picture this scene. A good sister visits a mother who has been deathly ill for over a week. There is a coating of dust everywhere. The dishes are piled up in the sink. The baby is crying. Dirty clothes are overflowing the hamper. There is no food in the house. The sister tells amusing stories about her own children for 10 or 15 minutes, and then glancing at her watch, she excuses herself, and she goes out the door. She says, and if you need anything, be sure to let me know. To say the least, this sister has not learned the meaning of the biblical word visit. But there is also another side to this pure religion. There is separating. Pure religion and undefiled before our God and Father is this, to visit the fathers and widows in their reflection, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Years ago, many of the people I knew tended to be more negative than positive in their religion. So when I preached on James 1.27, I generally reversed the order of the verse. After talking about being unspotted from the world, I then noted that this alone was not sufficient. We also had to be positive, to be showing positive concern for people. I even wondered sometimes why God used that order that he did. The other order seems to be more appropriate. But time has gone by. We have a generation raised on positive thinking, and suddenly James order seemed very appropriate. <coughs> Many of those I know now believe that just as long as your heart is good and you are generous, your lifestyle is not all that important. So James is speaking to today's generation. Earlier, he told everyone to put away all filthiness and overflowing wickedness. And now he tells every man to keep himself unspotted from the world. A young man once stopped his newly cleaned car in front of a house, walked up to the house and asked if he could park there. The man of the house told him, you can park your nice clean car here, but you can't drive it away. The young man thought it was a joke and left his car while he went about his business. He returned a few hours later to find his car covered with mud. He had parked by two mud holes and passing traffic had done the rest. He did not drive a clean car away. The world today is filled with sin mud holes, what a challenge to keep from getting unspotted. It is so great a challenge that some think it impossible and don't even try. But we don't use that reasoning in other areas. Our planet is greatly polluted, but most of us still try to keep physically clean. Disease, germs abound all around us, but most of us still try to keep well. Certainly it is hard to stay unspotted from the world. But again, I use Paul's words, I can do all things in him. To stay unspotted, we need to stay away from situation where sin abounds. Stay away from big sins, little sins, the obvious, sinful, and even the questionable. And we need always to stay close to Jesus so that our robes might be constantly washed white in the blood of the Lamb, Revelation 7, 14. In short, we need to be different from the world. If we are to live in the world, we must have both the positive and negative in our lives. Once a high society lady went with a social worker to the wrong side of the tracks to do her bit for charity. As they were departing after leaving a supply of food, clothing, and other items, a ragged little urchin raced by them, almost knocking the well-dressed woman down. The matron was repulsed and said to the social worker, Why isn't he cleaned up? Doesn't his mother love him? The social worker replied, Yes, his mother loves him. Some people love children, but I don't. Uh, some people love children, but don't hate dirt. And then she added, And there are some people who hate dirt, but don't love children. May God help us to be the kind of people who have a balanced view of Christianity. Let us love people and also hate spiritual dirt. And that is the lesson we need to do for others and be what God is calling us to be. True religion, not the fake stuff. Man, there's so much fake religion out there. People just doing whatever they want and then claiming they're Christians walking over people, being rude, being disrespectful, letting their mouth go crazy, and then claiming to be Christians. What we need is pure religion, true religion. And James gives us what that is. All right, well, have a good week. Hopefully we'll see you on Sunday. My son will be here. I'm excited about that. Uh, and we'll be celebrating the fruit of the Spirit of peace. Let us pray. Lord, as always, we thank you for being an amazing God to us. And we ask that you would just convict our hearts May we really wrap around our eyes, being, uh, letting truth speak into our hearts and our lives through your word, but also then living that out in a world uh, by not 
being spotted by the world, but yet showing love to a world and true religion. Give us a good week in Jesus' name. Amen. Bye-bye. Have a good week. Don't forget, next week, it won't be dropping live. It'll be just dropped in there. So you'll have to follow along by going to our YouTube site. And when it drops in on Wednesday, you'll see it. You can be part of that. Thank you.